All right, everyone, today, goal setting and your questions, our answers. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. All right, guys, well, we're kicking off a new year, and I know a lot of us uh, are attacking this month with some, with some zest, some zeal. Um, you know, maybe some of us felt like we lost some ground this year and this year, not only are we going to set the goals, but we're going to, we're going to execute on those goals and all of us have them. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm, uh, I'm doing quite well. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting time, right? It's, uh, the new year we talk about new year's resolutions and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Have you ever, are you someone who sets new year's resolutions generally? Has that maybe changed? good, you know, to the positive or negative since finding the Fi community. What what are your thoughts on that? I've always avoided making like event horizons around them yet. I do always end up having a list of things that I plan on, you know, tackling, uh, with a little bit more aggressively. You know, one interesting thing is usually perennial per, perennially, I'm going to roll with that. Yeah. that that's yeah. very yeah, close. Perennial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm not alone. Uh, the vast majority of, um, Americans have their health as a, a, a goal that they set. I would say probably 60, 70% of Americans at some level have their health and maybe specifically weight, weight loss reduction as a goal that they publicly state or privately state for themselves for the new year. And the, for the first time, I'm really going into this year, not really with that as being this tantamount, you know, goal, like this is it, this is what I need to do. And normally I find myself kind of, all right, it's the beginning of the year, really let myself go over the last six months. And, uh, hopefully by summer I can get it all back under control. And, and actually I was inspired by JD Roth who did this with me. JD Roth is now in the one seventies over the last six months to nine months that we've kind of been talking and keeping each other accountable. He has lost 20 to 30 pounds and he kept it off. And, and he's going into this year at the beginning of the year, normally when, you know, we're all saying when we need to do better with the health, he's already at his goal. Wait, how incredible is it when you go into the year at what you normally set as the goal? And that, and I find myself kind of within five pounds of kind of being in a similar place. So that has kind of taken a, a slightly backseat. And now that that is a little bit of backseat, I'm kind of focusing on the, the secondary and the tertiary aspects, which are more like, how do I feel? What are my energy levels? And I'm testing smaller variables because I've noticed that my caffeine take has had to get progressively higher and my fatigue levels have been a little bit higher as well. And that's, that just doesn't seem to, you know, that doesn't seem to be sustainable. Do you have to keep drinking more caffeine to get to a baseline? And so I'm starting to go back and test something that some of the underlying variables, um, are there certain food categories that make me more exhausted? It's really, it's tiny stuff, but the, some of the larger goals have already been beaten. So it's more just what are my general energy levels? And I've never started a year contemplating this puzzle. So it's kind of a cool place to be. Yeah. I think, I think there's something more there. So that kind of examined life, if you will, of not just going with the flow and just being wholly unaware. I think what you hit on just there, Jonathan, in like in a 15 seconds in passing comment is really, really critical. And I think we should actually like super slow down on that. Like a lot of people don't ever take that time. I know I was one of these people, you know, when, whenever I say a lot of people, it usually starts with something that I used to me, do me, yep. terribly <laughs> calamitously wrong. Yeah. Which is pretty much everything, but I never put two and two together on what I ate and how I felt until just like a random, random thing. And I'm not even sure if I can communicate this properly, but, uh, but I will try here is I went on vacation one time and I think just, you know, in my, the, the food intake changing for those couple of days, I wound up waking up one morning feeling like a million bucks, my hands and feet felt this is so bizarre. It's hard to, hard to describe it. My hands and feet felt fantastic. Like I had joint pain that was miraculously gone. And Jonathan, the biggest kicker is I had no idea I had joint pain mm. prior to that. I literally didn't know. Wow. I had no clue until the absence of it. And then it was like, Oh my goodness. I've, I've got a problem that I now need to work backwards to fix. And I was wholly unaware of said problem. Mm, that's it's crazy, right? I mean, imagine play this out, like translate that slightly. I never realized how tired I always am until I experienced not being tired. Yeah. 
I didn't realize what an uphill battle I was facing every second of every day until I had a single day of pure energy. Like, this is the, the examined life. I think we have a title for an episode right now. The examined life. I take nothing for granted. And it's, and it's obvious. Someone could take a look at your diet in this one example and write it up, but you know it's true. Take one day and drink nothing but alcohol all day long and see how you feel. The alcohol has a pronounced effect on your body's ability to function the next day. It's called a hangover. You know it's true. Take, you know, as delicious as pizza is, as much as like that is one of my preferred food groups. If I could build a pyramid, a food pyramid, like it would be on there, right? Eat too much of it, overconsume, and see how bad you feel. Now, now, now let's play that down. Forget about balance. Forget about, well, everything in moderation. Maybe no. Maybe are there low levels of this that over time build up that you have learned to take as normal, but it's killing you slowly. Or if it's not killing you, it's reducing your capacity to function the way that it was intended for you to be able to function. Is there low level toxicity from various food groups, either for you specifically as an individual that has unique characteristics, or maybe, you know, as a larger population that we just have accepted, yeah, it's, it's, you're going to be tired, but fortunately there's caffeine, you know, that can help. Well, may, maybe, and then, and I'm not, I don't know, you know, I'm not a food scientist and I haven't, it's been very, this isn't my, my chosen field, but I'm willing to live an examined life. And I've got enough space in other areas that I'm now willing to put that same intentionality, that same focus in this little space and say, I already eat a lot of the same foods over and over again. Can I, can I start observing the patterns? What would be the, the variables that we could switch out? And that's just kind of the place that, that, that I am and my, my wife is. And my wife has been getting a lot of these, these, these they're called aphthous ulcers. The common term is canker sores. They're those little little, uh, sores you get inside of your cheek. Sometimes when you have too much sugar or other things, you talk to a dentist and they ask you, why do you get one? And there's a million reasons. It can be stress. It can be trauma where you bit the inside of your cheek. It can be too much sugar, not enough sugar. It can be too much acidity, not enough acidity. You know, there's like literally a million reasons for this, but it could be your toothpaste. Um, that just shows you that like things matter in aggregate. And if something is happening over and over again, Instead of just saying, well, life is always going to be this way. I'm always going to be tired. I'm always going to be run down. I'm always going to be getting colds. I'm always going to be whatever. Maybe we could start doing these little mini experiments and figuring out what does it look like to identify the source and remove those, you know, events, those, those triggers from our life. Yeah. And Jonathan, we're obviously talking here. We've latched onto the food and health aspect of it. And, and I, and in, just to kind of <laughs> dial into that a little more, I found just random things that even like ostensibly are healthy, quote unquote. Like I used to have a smoothie every morning and this was just kind of like my baseline. And then I stopped having them for a couple of weeks and I realized, oh wow, like I'm not having a sugar crash where I need to nap any longer. And I then went back and had a smoothie again one morning and lo and behold, it came right back. I needed to have a 35 minute nap that afternoon. It was just like bizarre to see how something that even I thought was healthy. I thought I was doing something right for myself just was really negatively impacting me. And, and I think again, just kind of stepping back from the health part, because that's just one tiny little aspect of your life. This examine life concept, right? We can talk about personal finance. And that obviously is, is in theory what this show is about. But as you know, it's more about an overall life optimization. Anybody who thought this was only about finance unsubscribe from our show a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is very, very true. <laughs> but I think it, it does go to like that concept that we're always talking about, which is what do you value? Right. And I think it does tie into not just doing something mindlessly just because someone told you that this was good or healthy or whatever it may be, or like you need to figure that out for yourself. And I think that's why you and I really, really dial into intentionality and value and self-experimentation so much on the show, because you and I cannot give pronouncements. Not only do we not want to, but we're not in a, in a place to give pronouncements for anybody out there. 
we're just talking about what's working in our lives and what's not working, frankly, right? And things that we're trying to get better at. And we're trying to arm people with the ability to say, oh, wow, I can figure that out in my own life. If these two bozos in Richmond, Virginia are figuring their own lives out and trying to make these little 1% difference moves that can make their own lives better, like I can do that too. I can get up off the couch and look at every aspect of my life. Hey, I want more connection, right? But, you know, COVID in 2020. Okay, that's that. While that is a limit, it's a limiting belief that you can't have more connection. What could you do that's outside the box? You know, you could have a happy hour on your front lawn with a couple friends and just set up chairs 10 feet apart or whatever it may be, right? Like, it's a limiting belief that you can't have connection because of X, right? Or you can't get wealthy because nobody ever taught you, right? Or you can't be healthy because you have bad genes, right? Like that, that was always my limiting belief. You know, I come from a family of, of eaters and people who are unhealthy. Like I had this kind of predetermination that I was going to be unhealthy, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that is incredibly empowering, Jonathan. Well, I'm curious if we're talking about this exam in life. I mean, that, that was, you know, kind of my little focus and this challenge that we're undertaking. And, and I would look at it as a, it's not a goal as much as uh, in light of another conversation we had, we'll share it in an upcoming episode. It's more of a mastery process. It's a process that's not, an, it's, I don't know what the end result is. It's an experiment. But what does this exam in life look like for you this year? Or what do your goals look like this year? What are you challenging yourself with? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. And you know, it's funny because actually we had a, a Facebook post, uh, from Elaine in our community and she said, I'm curious what everyone's top five personal goals are for 2021. And a couple hundred people wrote in with, with their goals. And, and I am not someone who generally sets new year's resolutions or like very specific goals because like, to me, it always seems like a, like a letdown when I, when I get there, it's like, okay, I reached it. And now what, you know, like, or was that really all it was cracked up to be? So like, I, I think I, I've tried to internalize this whole concept of, of systems versus goals, which I know James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits and setting up systems that work for my life. And for me, because I am still like a, a very numbers based guy, like I have actually set up kind of like like a tracking system. And, and frankly, this might be a little too geeky and analytical for, for a lot of people, but so far, and you know, we're only, uh, about two weeks into 2021. So, you know, frankly, I could still fall down on this, but so far it is actually working. And, um, I did in fairness, get some inspiration from, uh, Chris Gillibo. He has an article called how to conduct your own annual review, which I found absolutely fascinating and will, We'll put that in the show notes. And he talked about like, not just setting like vague or non-measurable goals. Like I want to be happier or I want to be healthier, like actually setting specific things that you could have like little checkpoints that you could figure out, like, am I on target for this? Like, is this going to like, where am I? What do I have to do to get to that next checkpoint? And what I've decided to do is just kind of set up, let's say it looks like about eight different things that in theory. I want to accomplish as part of like a system. So that for me means putting in the hours. It's not that I need to get to X. It means like I want to very specifically work out at least three times a week. So instead of saying I need to lift or I need to squat 300 pounds by the end of 2021, because you know, what, what is that? And what do I do at the end of it? Like, can I even get there? I have no idea, frankly, but I know that if I work out three plus times a week, 150 times a year, that's a pretty darn good system. That's going to make me healthier as a person. So like that, that's one of them. And, and actually the maybe more interesting ones are, I do not move enough. I do not actually walk enough. If I had, a, we're a highly fitbit, evolved it, beings that have figured out how to exert uh, get maximum <laughs> results with minimal movement. It's actually to the point of our inevitable decline as a species. <laughs> yeah, it's it's frightening. Like how little, e even given the number of hours that I have in a day, like I probably, if I had a Fitbit, I'd probably walk well, 
well, well, well, less than 5,000 steps a day. And I mean, probably dramatically less at that. So I actually kind of set up, this is like a, a take on James Clear's habit stacking, which he talked about habit stacking in taking a current habit you have and then stacking another habit that you want to create on top of that or, or combining with it somehow. So like if you have a habit of making your coffee and having like a nice relaxing cup of coffee in the morning, trying to stack something on top of that and kind of tie them together in some way or make it that you can't have your nice relaxing cup of coffee without this new habit. But I, I took kind of a, a take on that. So Jonathan, what I did was I realized that again, even with all these hours in the day, I wanted to walk. And actually the big one that I said was I went up uh, learning the Japanese language in college and I studied abroad in Japan and I was, you know, reasonably, reasonably good at it. But, but I have to say it was like that, the ultimate system versus goal, but looking at the goal back then. So the goal was to very simply pass intermediate Japanese so I could graduate college. And that was it. It wasn't to be fluent in Japanese. It wasn't to, you know, be able to speak with my friends in Japanese. It wasn't anything laudable. It was just, I have a goal. I need to reach it. That's it. And Jonathan, I kid you not, I never spoke Japanese ever again. Like after studying abroad, after reaching this, this requirement, that was it. So like 1998 was the last time. And I've always said like, I would love to get back to this and I would love to, uh, was it interest led learning at the time or was it entirely put on you by an external, you know, it was entirely external, entirely external, but you know, it's, it's a country that I'd love to take my family to. It's a language that I really enjoyed at the time, but I, I, I don't think I realized it until decades later. And so anyway, long story short is I also set a goal of basically taking a 30 minute Japanese lesson five times a week for this entire year. And I'm, I'm using the Pimsleur language learning, which is kind of like the, one of the gold standards in, in language learning. And it's, it's about doing, putting in the time. It's about putting in this 30 minutes a day. And sadly, I knew that I wasn't going to do both this walk and the Japanese separately, because it was just like that, like kind of, I don't know, the overbearing of like, oh, I've got to do these two 30 minute things a day. And it just wasn't going to happen. So I said to myself, all right, what would it look like if I stacked them together? So I found out like, again, I had this limiting belief and you'll see that as, as kind of like the, the theme throughout this, I had this limiting belief that I could only do the Japanese in like an absolute silent room with my Bose noise canceling headphones on and have my computer in front of me where I could take notes. And, you know, I realized frankly that this wasn't going to happen. It wasn't sustainable, but what I said was, okay, what would it look like if I tried to listen to the Japanese lesson while I was walking and I downloaded Pimsleur's app and I said, all right, let's just give it a whirl. And is it perfect? No, it is not perfect, but it's about 85% as good. And you know what? I've found that I am doing it every single day now. We're pretty darn, pretty darn close to every single day. And the other kind of ancillary benefit is I realized how much downtime I have in the day where I just like would scroll on the phone or listen to another random podcast. I backslid in my, uh, I now, you know, have 30 podcasts that I subscribe to. Even I've though never I met another it. podcast host that listens to as many podcasts <laughs> as, as, as you do. You are, you're quite proficient in your yeah. Yeah, I do. I do listen to maybe too many, but so now again, it's not a hundred percent as good as, as doing it, like I said, in that silent room, but I find that I'm now doing the lessons multiple times. So I'm actually learning it better in these bite-sized segments because I'm, I'm going over it again and again. So anyway, that is a very, very long monologue for, I think I I'm finding a system that works for me. And I think that is the critical part. So like, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here, right? Like if I needed it to be perfect, I knew in my own life that it was not going to happen, but I came up with a system that is good or better. And I'm now 100% convinced that it is going to work long-term. And I think, I think there's real power there. 
So we'll, uh, we'll link up Chris's article in the show notes for this episode, but give us a sense for, uh, you know, what you did or what an individual could do if they were interested in pursuing this, what does putting together your own annual review look like? What are the action steps and what's the deliverable on the other side? Yeah. So this, uh, and, and this is the very first time that I've ever done something like this. I always thought it was kind of like a little hokey to, you know, like I said, do, uh, new year's resolutions or things like this. It just, it never worked until, until it worked. And I, I think like I found this system that, that is going to work for me. And, uh, yeah, in this article, he has a, a download for it's either a Google spreadsheet or, or an Excel doc that kind of sets, sets his intentions for the year. Like what, what are the big picture, like the purpose, the outcomes, the theme of the year, which I think is kind of cool. And then he breaks his life up into like 10, or 10 or so different areas and then sets these concrete goals for each one of them. So like learning, self, health, friends, family, community, travel, financial on the saving investing side, financial on the giving side, spirit, spirituality, like all these different aspects of your life and just kind of breaking them down into these little things that matter to you. And that again, aren't just these vague, vague goals that like are ultimately meaningless. Like I want to be healthier. Like, okay, you know, we all want to be healthier, but what are you going to actually do to get there? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, this is very, very personal, but I think this is something that a lot of people out there could get value from. And Jonathan, we'll have this in the show notes and people can find that at chooseabuy.com slash 287. That'll take you to the show notes for this episode 287. That's a uh, very useful one for the idea, the annual review, but then also for the uh, connect correct pronunciation of, uh, Chris's last name, Jillabo, 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 Gillabo. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's Jillabo. You were brave to try the first time. So <laughs> I mean, here over here, Jonathan and Don, so it's the last name. So I don't exactly roll off. Yeah. Name, so. <laughs> well, yours, you get yours misspelled right. all the time, right? Yes. Everybody assume. Yeah, there you go. All right. Moving on. Not better. <laughs> all right. Well, new years, new actions, and, uh, maybe even in some cases, new skills. Uh, one interesting thing, I know we talked about this in the past, but you and I both live in suburbia. Um, we are suburbanites and we live in, in, in the Richmond, Virginia area. And, uh, while we do not have large plots of land, I think even at a micro level, um, both of us in some capacity have kind of pondered what it would be like to maybe start to consider growing maybe a small micro garden or, uh, some herbs or something, something along these lines, um, you know, just as a skill set, And it's a skill set that neither of us possess. I know you actually had an extended conversation with someone inside the community about this very topic. Yeah, this was cool. A uh, handful of months ago, I got an email from uh, James at grass to veggies.com. And he said, I'm new to the whole fire concept and I'm diving headfirst into it. I just started listening to your podcast recently. And oddly enough, in the past five years of my life, I've done quite a lot of things that align with the FI message, but for other reasons other than financial independence. And he said, one of the main things I've been doing is growing my own food to cut down on grocery bills, but to still be able to eat healthily. This year, I should be able to go the whole year by only eating produce that I've grown myself. And I thought that that just kind of piqued my curiosity. So I asked him if he had any kind of quick hit tips that he could send in on a voicemail and he replied. So yeah, Jonathan, let's cue this up. Hey guys, James with grass2veggies.com here. Brad had asked me to call in and leave some quick tips on growing your own food. So here we are. Tip number one for growing your own food, just try growing things. You don't need any knowledge to do this. So many people want to know everything before they'll try starting a garden or try growing their own food. You don't need to know anything. Just do it. Uh, you will learn as you go. Go into it with the mindset of you don't know anything and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to kill plants. That's okay. Just try it. Tip number two, grow what you're actually going to eat. If you don't like kale, then don't grow kale. Plain and simple, grow things you like to eat. Tip number three, if you're wanting to grow food, then grow squash. Squash is king. So many people focus on growing tomatoes and peppers, things like that, which those are fine and dandy, but fact of the matter is they are just not as productive and they don't provide you with pounds and pounds of food like squash does. Uh, the tomatoes and peppers, they're also temperamental. They grow slowly. They need to be started inside. Squash is not like that. 
squash you plant outside after the first frost, you water it, it grows, then you get pounds and pounds and pounds of food from a single squash plant. It's fantastic. So if I was going to do this, I would take a four foot by four foot plot of land or a six foot by six foot plot of land. And this is if I were to start from scratch. And within that plot of land, I would plant four squash plants. I would do two summer squashes and two winter squashes. For these summer squashes, I would do a zucchini and a yellow squash. For the winter squashes, I would do an acorn and a butternut squash. And I would do those because I like those a lot. And they grow really well. Then once you plant them, and you want to plant them two to three to feet, two to three feet apart all the way around. Once you plant them, you water them, they grow. Water the roots, not the leaves. This goes for most vegetables, but squash in particular are very susceptible to powdery mildew, which forms on the leaves when they are too wet for too long. So water the roots, that's where the plant needs the water anyways. Tip number four, get creative. If you don't own a house or have a place to grow food or grow vegetables, I'm sure you have a friend who has a house or a friend who has a yard that they're not using. There's probably a community garden in your area. I will bet that there's a local farm around you. Even if you're in New York City, they are uh, starting to grow food in shipping containers in basements, which is ridiculously awesome. But they probably need help. Local farms in general just need help. They have a really hard time finding good, reliable help. And they generally ask that you just give a few hours of your time a week. And in exchange, they usually give you a bag of food which is basically a CSA share, Community Supported Agriculture. So for a very minimal investment on your time, two hours of time, you are getting food for the week. It's fantastic. That also gives you a resource. You then have access to that farmer, so you can ask them questions. You can pick their brain as you start getting more interested and as you see how they do things. You get to ask them, hey, why do you do this? How do you do that? They also might have a plot of land, like a 50-foot plot of land that they're not using at all. And if that's the case, they might just go, hey, see that 50-foot plot of land that's covered in weeds? Go grow stuff over there. Go grow your own food. Have fun. Tip number five, compost and build soil health. You want to build up the soil health. You don't need those chemical fertilizers. Those just kill everything in the soil. Compost builds your soil health. It builds the microbes. It builds the nutrients that the plants need. Plants need nutrients to thrive. Think of it as if you only ate sugar. You wouldn't be getting your nutrients. You'd get a lot of diseases really fast and you'd probably die really fast. Plants are the same way. You need to give them the nutrients they need and you do that by giving them compost. So compost. All right, to recap, tip number one, just try growing things. Tip number two, grow what you're actually going to eat. Tip number three, if you're wanting to grow food, grow squash. Tip number four, get creative. Tip number five, compost. Let me know if you guys have any questions. This is James with grass2veggies.com. Have a great night, guys. This is fantastic. You know, not having previewed this voicemail ahead of time, I was not, you know, totally confident of the tips that James would provide, but I have, I've heard for a long time that when you buy your vegetables and your produce, you should try to buy local. And, and obviously part of that implicit is you're supporting your local community, which makes sense. But another part of that is that when you're buying from smaller farms, the the nutrient density and the way that uh, th- that these produce are grown and the nutrients are given as they grown are going to be of higher quality, meaning you're going to get more nutritious, better for you vegetables than you do if you're buying for some sort of you know mass produced churn and burn type produce farm. And you know historically, I've only bought bought from these. But even better than that, if you want to level up even further, is if you could uh, take a portion of the produce that you eat, you know, each week or each month or each year. If you just can grow it yourself and you know exactly what it's getting, and I think all of us immediately start with a tomato, and then it just doesn't work or it fails or the rabbit eats it or whatever, and then you're like, "Well, I'm a failure. I'm really bad at this." All right, I have a. How many of us have said, "Well, I have a black thumb," or "I have a," you know, "I I, I can't grow stuff. I just I just can't do it. It doesn't work." And just stop there when re- without recognizing that with every other thing that we've tried, that we have applied this examined life mentality, we've said, no, that's the, that was the first question. Now we know what obstacles we bumped up against. How can we solve for that? And we can get to our, we can get to the result that we're looking for. Brad, I got, this is a great, this is a great voicemail. Yeah, it really was. And I love that concept of 
being creative, right? Like maybe looking at your constraints and trying to figure out how you can turn that into a positive, right? I'm thinking about turning some unused space or some space you thought was too small to do anything productive with and turning it into a useful garden, right? Or just like he said, you can use containers. You can, people are growing this on rooftops in cities, right? Like if, if they can do it with those constraints and you know, what excuse do you and I have with, you know, suburban backyards, Yeah, exactly. Right? We started with this. I mean, I started, I set both of us up with this massive limiting belief, right? Like, <laughs> oh, we, we're, we're suburbanites. We live in, we don't have huge plots of land We're you know, and then James is like, do you have four feet? Do you have a basement? <laughs> like, do you have six feet? Do you have a basement? And even if you don't have any of that, here's five other solutions that you could use to get started. And it builds on what Laura Aldaney was talking about. Brad, I'm sure you can give me that episode number where there's other types of social capital. Could you use this experiment to connect with your community? How valuable is it when you find these experts because you've been able to help them in some small way by providing a small amount of man hours or woman hours. And as a result, not only do you get some level of produce, but you also get access to pick their brain not just a generic Google search, but someone in your area with years of expertise of troubleshooting the exact obstacles that you're bound to run into. Yeah. And that was episode 248. You are more than your financial capital. And, and yeah, that last point is really important. And, and this certainly transcends just growing vegetables, right? Like find those experts, find people who are doing this, find people who have a passion for something that you're interested in getting into and just learn from them, ask questions like people. You might be surprised at how open people are to helping you when you just show genuine curiosity. Think about that, Jonathan, right? Like if somebody came to you and like they had spent, you know, they wanted to become a podcaster and they had questions and they, you know, showed they weren't just trying to impose on your time, right? Like you can sniff those people out, the people who are just too lazy to do the work right? And they just want to waste your time and, and have you answer everything for them versus the person who has genuine curiosity, who has tried a couple things and has like very specific questions. Like you're going to help that person, right? Like that's just the way it works. And people want, humans are good, like at their heart, like they want to help people. And I've found in my life that when you come at this from the right perspective and not try to waste somebody's time, but try to genuinely learn, like you're going to be surprised at how many mentors you can find and people that want to help you and help you in ways that you probably wouldn't even guess just by asking, just by being interested, by trying to help, by offering your own assistance where you can, like, this is, this is the kind of social capital that lubricates the world because people want to help other people. It's not a contrived networking nonsense. It's at their heart. People want to help others. You know, who's a perfect manifestation of this actually. And I'm, I'm very proud of them is actually my brother, Andrew, who actually edits our podcast show. Uh, he's been editing it for a while, but, but you probably, I don't know if I told you this, maybe, maybe you heard about this, but I'll tell you now. Um, Andrew got inspired by a few guests that we had on plus some of his own interest about the idea of house sitting and then homesteading specifically, and then finding people that have built their own self-contained ecosystem. So they you know, they, they, they make the food that they produce, they make a living out of that. And so he, um, he follows a lot of podcasts that are in this space as well and talk about this. And then he went into our Facebook group and we have, um, a homegrown choose a five group where people that have built these types of platforms, you know, that the, they, they share tips and strategies. And he went in that group and asked like, can I come get room and board for a few months and I'll work the land? I'll, I just want to learn. I want to learn the skill set, and I'm, I'd give up a month or two just to come there and, and do this. And so he took a whole month this year. By the way, he's got a job that's pretty flexible and remote. There's a task that needs to be done, but when you do it, it's totally up to you. It just needs to be done. You can do it. You know, did, there's a lot of jobs like this that are out there. And he took up, he found someone inside the community that had, said, yeah, come on, bring it. Let's do it. And he went and spent a month there and learned this. And his goal now, after being inspired by this and other information, is slowly to start working towards building his own, you know, sustainable homestead. And he's building up the skill set by doing exactly what James just described in this voicemail. Pretty, it's pretty cool. <laughs> that is unbelievable. So I had no idea, right? Which is crazy. And like, that's actually one of the cool things about 
this new economy, right? Like Andrew is by definition, an independent contractor, right? Like to your point, like he has certain tasks, but he does them on his own time, wherever he is. I, I assumed that he was in his apartment here in Richmond, but you're telling me he was like an entire month this year. Midwest. He was yeah. Out. I think it was like Missouri or maybe even no. farther West than that. We'll have to ask him uh, <laughs> to get clarification. Yeah. Oh my God. He, and, and honestly, I think this is the point he's in some ways, and I know he's editing this, so he's probably laughing at me a little bit, but, but, um, in some ways his mindset is already so fi, it's like tough to comprehend. Like it's post money, like money. Yes. Is a necessary tool that we need to be able to do the things that we want to do, but the things he want to do are not very expensive. You know, it's not, it's not a uh, very flashy lifestyle. It's, it's one of purpose and meaning. It's one, it's a circular system and it's a skill-based system. You know, he, he, um, he actually, even here in Richmond, if I were trying to find out where things are happening, if I want to learn different skills, like if I wanted to find a maker space or a local farm or anything like that, he's going to know because he put the time in to do that research and find it. He knows where the maker spaces are here in Richmond. He has a membership at those. He's building these skill sets, which are very hands-on. And his idea of FI is not a very, it's, it's not super flashy. It's not a consumption-based FI. Uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 I want to be able, I want, I want autonomy. I want mastery. I want purpose. I want freedom. I want flexibility. I want choice. Um, and I want it on my terms. And you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to actually see it lived out and realize like maybe the, maybe the term that would have been used in a past in years past would have been like this idea of a Renaissance man. Maybe it feels kind of, you know, it doesn't feel exactly like what we're seeing, but it's, it's, you know, my time on earth is not to be a widget maker on an assembly line, making sure the corporate shareholders get an ever increasing price. It's, I, I want to create and I want to learn skills and uh, I want fulfillment. And, and that doesn't look like following the same path that everybody else is following. It looks like for me, for him, you know, it looks like a version of this homesteading, maybe with the goal of at some point having his own homestead. Pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's incredible. And and yeah, I mean, that really speaks to so much of what we try to get across here at Chooseify that you get so much value and power in your own life just by understanding the concepts of Phi, right? You don't have to be at this mythical Phi number to get this autonomy and power in your own life. It starts really from that first moment, that first moment you decide, wow, this makes sense. I'm going to make some small changes in my life to make my life better. And, you know, obviously I don't know Andrew's personal finance situation, but just based on his age and such, like, I have to assume that he's not even close to the definition of buy by, by the book, right? As we describe it of 25 times your annual expenses. And you, even find some, some identity in this too, right? Like you're not at five by the definition either, but for all intents and purposes, you live a financially independent lifestyle. And you're saying that Andrew can do that on, on a totally different level with, without even being as far along down the path as you are. Like, that's, what's so cool about this is we can all find what we want our lives to look like. Mm. And then we can design the life around that by focusing on value. And that doesn't mean cutting, right? Like that, I, I, I can't describe this enough that it doesn't always mean cutting. It means spending on what you value, right? So in my own life, like we are not frugal misers by any means. Like if anything, we spend way more money now than we did 10 years ago, but it's based on a point of value. And there are still things that I don't spend money on, right? Like we don't value cars, so we don't buy fancy cars. We don't value expensive meals at restaurants. So, you know, even in normal times, we don't do that. We go to happy hours because we like the experience, but we don't, we don't need to spend the money, right? So, or we come up with an adaptation of that, which is Laura and I like our time together. So we have a happy hour in the house every night at five o'clock, right? And that costs a dollar fifty a beer, and we sit there and have a nice time together while we're cooking dinner, or while Laura's cooking dinner, more specifically. And it, it's just like that's finding the value in something, 
and just examining what you want out of an experience, what you want out of your life, and then working backwards to just figure out how do I implement this? I agree. And I, and I, and I would even say, go so far as to say the goal here is not to have the most money, which is what is typically marketed to you. It is to be post money. It's beyond the point that money matters. And that's different than like uh, different. This isn't a political thing. It's not a, it's not a political fix. It's not, you know, universal basic income or social security or even a, a net worth. It's a fact that like you are self-sufficient. You have, you have gotten to the point, be, whether you got to the point you had no expenses or you got to the point where you had enough money, you can be where Brad is and spend less than 10 minutes a month worrying about your finances. If you're paycheck to paycheck, you're not post money, right? You, you, you're not, you're stuck because you got to figure out how to get enough money to make it to the next paycheck. But if you're worth 10 million, trying to figure out how to get to 20 million, trying to figure out how to get to 40 million and terrified that you're going to lose it all, you're also not post money. You've gotten stuck in another trap. And so there's the billionaire trying to figure out how to become a multi-billionaire is in the same trap that the person that's paycheck to paycheck is in. It's fear. You're operating out of fear. You haven't done the exercise to figure out what is it that you actually want your life to look like. The story of the Mexican fisherman, you can Google it separately, is applicable here. What is it that you want your life to look like? And what do you need to be able to pull that off? Not from a scenario, and I think this is really important, not from a scenario where it is well, you know, the government's giving me this regular check every month and, because they could change. They could change their mind. That's totally different. I'm not actually even talking. It's not a validation of judgment. I'm just saying in terms of your financial independence is based on the things that you can control and what the government does this month or next month, that could change. Like, we, we, you know, you just, that's totally different. But getting to post money is because you've built a system that works for you and, 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 and you've controlled everything that you can control and you have a sense of peace about it. So Paycheck to paycheck is bad. Trying to go from 3 billion to 6 billion and terrified the entire time is also bad. They're both traps. We've got to get to post money. And the only way you do that is by putting some attention to what is it that you want your life to look like. All right, next in the mailbag, I wanted to address a question that we got from Suzanne Brad. I believe this was about uh, expense ratios. Yeah, this was a really great question. And it's one of these things, you know, you and I talk about how important it is to keep your investing expenses low. But sometimes we need to take a step back and just explain to people, how do you even find what an expense ratio is that you're paying on a certain fund or what is an expense ratio, right? So Susanna asked, I hear a lot about expense ratios, but find it so difficult to understand where I go to see what I'm paying in expenses in everything we're invested in. My husband and I are each in a 401k. We have two IRAs. We have a Roth IRA. We have an HSA that is invested. And she said, are there any podcasts or articles about this? And Jonathan, this was one of those that like, I actually responded to her immediately because while it's theoretically a simple question, like it's a devastatingly simple one in, in the best possible way that like, this is critical information. And I knew we had to talk about this on the show. Yeah, Brad couldn't agree more. And I think the key here is for people to understand that why an expense ratio exists. And when we talk about expense ratios, there's actually two different things that are, that are potentially kind of being melded. You know, it's not technically true, but in the reality that what people are actually paying, there's two different things to watch for. One of them is a fee that is attached to the fund for it being executed the way it is. So this fund represents all of these different individual companies that are being bought and sold at different times, especially under the case of like active management. And there's a team of people that make those decisions, very high powered, very knowledgeable, very degreed, highly salaried people that make these decisions on when to get out and when to get into these particular uh, stocks or ETFs or whatever. They're all bundled together in this fund that you own. You have to pay their salaries. Everybody that owns this fund has to pay their salaries. And that is the expense ratio. And then the other aspect of this is if you are accessing this, this fund, this mutual fund through an advisor, through this point person that is acting as your gateway to them, they might charge you an assets under management fee. So you have another layer of this one person pointing you to this one team of people to have this fund. And so you got to combine them together. So it depends on what you're talking about here would be my first thing. If you're talking about going directly to your company website, and, you know, in, in the case of your 401k or whatever, and you're buying a fund directly, then really all we're talking about is the expense ratio. And Brad, I know you'll say exactly what to look for there. 
The other aspect is if you're going through a individual, you have a guy or gal that does all this for you, then there's a chance, high chance probably, that that person takes a percentage cut called a, called an assets under management fee, and then they then give you advice about what funds to get into, and those funds have an expense ratio, which is a percentage as well. So in, if you're going through a person, you actually have to do this research twice. That's kind of the nuance I want to add there. Uh, Brad, I'm sure you can give you a little more specific in terms of when you're actually talking about the expense ratio attached to a fund. Yeah, Jonathan, that was a really good explanation. I'll just add on. So at Vanguard's website, for instance, they say just like the actual definition of the, an expense ratio reflects how much a mutual fund or an ETF pays for portfolio management, administration, marketing, and distribution, among other expenses. And you'll see it expressed as a percentage of the fund's average net assets. So that's why you'll always see this in a percentage basis. So we want it as low as humanly possible. It's, it's almost akin to when you donate to a charity, right? Like you want to see that as much money as possible is going to the actual programs and not to administration. It's very similar here. So when you invest in a mutual fund that has a really high expense ratio, like eight tenths of a percent or higher 1%. I mean, we've seen one and a half percent, like that means one on one and a half percent, $1 and 50 cents of every hundred that you invest is just gone to you. Okay. That you're paying salaries. And in very, very rare cases, is that actually going to be worthwhile for you? That the benefit that you're getting from that fund is going to outweigh that the drag of that expense. And Jonathan, you and I have talked numerous, numerous times on this podcast about just how much fees can impact your, your investing return. And for longtime listeners, they'll get tired of hearing this example, but, but for, for newer listeners or just kind of to let this sink in again, I'll, I, I will show this example yet again. And it, it's from an old article that I wrote on my, one of my original websites. And I talked about having basically someone who started with a hundred thousand dollars, you know, this is someone who's been on the path to five for a number of years. They have a hundred thousand saved up. They invest a thousand dollars a month for 40 years on top of that, that original nest egg they had. And, uh, you know, I, I assume some pretty high returns. So these are not, not what we anticipate now, but, but the math holds. So I talked about a 9% return annually, just as the gross return for for the market and you turn all of that, that money, that hundred K plus the thousand bucks a month into about $7.2 million. Now let's say you invested that money in VTSAX, which uh, is the total stock market index fund for Vanguard. This is just an example, not our, our recommendation certainly, but at that time the expense ratio was tiny. It was 0.05. It's actually subsequently gone down you would have lost a hundred, $111,000 to fees. Okay. So that's about the best you can possibly do. So your return would have been close to 7.1 million as opposed to the total market return of 7.2 million. But if you invested in a mutual fund with 1% expense ratio, instead of that minuscule 0.05, your return would have dropped $1.9 million. You'd only have about 5.3 million as opposed to the 7.2 that you would have expected with the, the full market return. And then if you doubled down on that and had a 1% expense ratio on your mutual funds, plus a 1% fee that you're paying to your advisor, right? Oh, it's just 1% you say, right? But what that does is that cuts off $3.3 million, almost half of your total return. So that is painting a picture of why expenses matter that over the long term it's almost impossible to believe that you can outperform the market. So why invest in expensive funds? So that's the background at which, you know, I, I feel the need Jonathan to, uh, to say every time, because it is so critical, but my answer to Suzanne and her question was that I, I said, I would just very simply Google the funds name and expense ratio. So very simply in this case, my hypothetical VTSAX expense ratio. I just went to Google and typed that in. That was it. Yep. And the very first result was Vanguard's website and it's the profile for VTSAX. And in the upper right-hand corner on all the fund information, it says expense ratio and it says 0.04%. And 
that is it. So it doesn't have to be a black box. It doesn't have to be, oh, these are the random funds in my 401k. I have no idea what they are. Like you can take ownership of this. And even if your company or even if whoever it is doesn't make it easy to find, you can spend 30 minutes or probably less, frankly, and just do exactly that. Find the fund, the funds ticker symbol, which you almost invariably have listed there and just take that and type in that fund name, expense ratio into Google, and you will find it. You know, Yahoo Finance might show up and that might be a real simple way to find it. It's, it is going to be there just one or two clicks away. So if you have a list of 20 or 30 funds, I know it's annoying, but that 30 minutes is going to be worth your while. And, and the other thing that I would just add on to this is that, so you have your actual, your fund that you're talking about. So in the case of Brad, he's talking about BTSAX. And then you have, am I going through a person that's charging me a assets under management fee? Maybe, maybe not. Or am I going through the platform? And is the platform uh, commission free or do they have a charge each time that, that I make a purchase? And so, as you know, inside the FI community, we really advocate for a long-term buy and hold mentality. Oh, you know, buy dollar cost average when it's going up, get excited that, you know, everything you have this time is going up. And when it's crashing, get excited that you're buying things on, um, as they're going on sale, because you own large swaths of the market, you're buying, you know, the winners and the losers, you're buying them all, but you're buying them with as you know, low of fees as possible, the way that, the way that you're doing them. And so while there are a ton of options out there for short term, you know, day trader investors, and most of them have a lot of fees uh, involved for long-term investors, people that are buying, holding for the long term. Yes, you can use the short term, you know, these day trading platforms, but they charge you way more than you need to worry about. So for long-term investors, for long-term investing, um, it's actually why you hear me talking about M1 finance all the time, because they actually charge a commission free platform commission free. So, you, so you, there is no, there is no cost to you. It's just whatever the expense ratio is of, of the fund. And so I would say for those type of people in that mindset, M1 is, is it's likely the ideal choice for these, this medium to long-term investors. Um, or, you know, for those of you that are active traders, but you're trying to pull back a little bit and add some sort of long-term investing to your, to your finance stock. Now, this would not be the case for those of you that are still, uh, getting, you know, you have a 401k, you're going to do that through your employer. That's good. It's likely going to be through your employer. You should use if it's Fidelity or Schwab or Vanguard or maybe TD Ameritrade. Maybe there's others. You're going to go there first and you're going to look through those options. As Brad was just saying, just see what the expense ratio is. You can go and you can see which ones are index funds. That's another way of, of sorting the options that you're given. But when you're talking about either a Roth IRA account that you're setting up on your own or uh, you're taxable investing, and you have a medium to a long-term mindset, um, just maybe consider or take a look at M1 Finance. We put together a great article with some of the summaries of the, the features and why it stands out and why I'm such a fan. Just go to choosefi.com slash M1 for more information on that. So Brandon, that's about all I got for today. I mean, I think what I would just encourage people is be excited. 2021, I'm sure there's a lot of new stuff coming our way. I'm sure it's not going to be year without obstacles, but if we're taking this examine to life approach and we're taking a look at any obstacle that's handed to us and saying, well, what question does this prompt? And then being willing to pursue that, we're going to dominate this year. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. Mm -hmm.